Welcome. I'm delighted to welcome everybody here tonight to our program, Mirroring Practice, Poets on Jasper Johns. My name is Linnea West. I work in public programs at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I and the museum recognize Philadelphia as part of Lenape Hokink, the ancestral homelands of the Lenape peoples, a long history of broken treaties, forced migrations, and fraudulent agreements, such as the walking purchase of 1737, displaced many Lenape from this land. The museum and its staff strive to understand our place within the legacy of colonization and to act as allies to Lenape people and their vibrant communities today, including the federally recognized tribes, Delaware Tribe, Delaware Nation, and the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to Lenape ancestors past and present by committing to build a more inclusive and equitable space for all. And at the museum currently, there is a Jasper Johns exhibition on its walls titled Mind Mirror and on view both at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, it offers a deep look into the work of American artist Jasper Johns. The exhibition is up until February 13th. So you still have time to visit or revisit it and I certainly encourage you to do so. Jasper Johns is someone who has read poetry all of his life and he's brought poetry into dialogue with his art. And you can see this in the way he evokes poets such as John O'Hara or Hart Crane in his works. And art perhaps is, is always a conversation with those who have come before and an expectation of those to come. So in that vein, I propose that tonight's reading expands the conversation that John has engaged with over his long career, bringing new voices to bear, not just on John's work, but on some very old questions held in common. What does it mean to make art? How do we do it? How do we see it? So tonight we are joined by four poets who will be sharing new work with us. Um, if you all would like to turn on your cameras now and join me on screen, uh, please. Thank you. I'm going to share a little bit about each of our speakers tonight. And we'll also put longer bios and links to websites in the chat so you can um, find more information if you like. Our first reader tonight is Rick Barrow. He's a poet whose most recent volume of poetry is The Galleons, which was on the long list for the National Book Award. He's received honors from the National Endowment for the Arts, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, and he directs the Rainier Writing Workshop, a low residency MFA program in creative writing. We're also joined by Dr. Khadija Queen, the author of six books, including Anodyne, which was a winner of the William Carlos Williams Award from the Poetry Society of America. She's written ekphrastic works, including the chapbook Exercises in Painting and Fearful Beloved. She's an associate professor of creative writing at Virginia Tech. There are also, oh no, I forgot. We are also joined by Cole Swenson, the author of 19 books of poetry, her most recent Art and Time features hybrid poem essays on innovative landscape art. A former Guggenheim Fellow, she's a recipient of the Iowa Poetry Prize, the SF State Poetry Center Book Award, and the National Poetry Series, and has been a finalist for the National Book Award. Last but not least, we are joined by Brian Tier, the author of six critically acclaimed books, including Companion Grasses and The Empty Form Goes All the Way to Heaven, his most recent book, Doomstead Days, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle, Kingsley Tuft, and Lambda Literary Awards. He's an associate professor at the University of Virginia. So a big welcome to you all. Thank you for being here with us. Each of these poets will read new work made in response to Jasper Johns on the occasion of this exhibition. We're gonna go in alpha order by last name and I'll let each of you hand it off to the next person. We're saving a bit of time at the end um, for a little discussion on, on how this all came together. A few notes before we start, the, the chat is open. I see many of you are saying hello there. Please do say hello, share where you're tuning in from. Likewise, during the reading, if you, if you hear something you like or a phrase that resonates with you, give it some love in the chat. Uh, this is a communal experience and we'd love to hear from you. The program is closed captioned. You can turn 
closed captions on or off by clicking the CC button in your Zoom toolbar. If you want to change the look of your screen, there's a divider bar and you can drag it left or right to change the size of the visuals in relation to the speaker. Finally, uh, we are recording the program. Tomorrow, we're going to send a follow up email after the program. It'll include a link to the recording. It'll also include any links that we share in the chat, any information we shared there. So you can always look back to that. All that said, Rick, uh, I invite you to take the stage. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm so grateful to Linnea West and the Philadelphia Museum of Art for making this event happen. Thanks especially to Linnea for her considerable labor on behalf of us poets. I'm also really grateful to Brian Tier for curating the poets participating in this event. And what an honor to read with Brian, Cole, and Khadija. The poem I'm going to read is titled Crosshatch. And I took my inspiration from all of Jasper Johns's work, but particularly from the 10 year period in the 70s when he created the crosshatch paintings. I was drawn to the abstract beauty of these paintings, which were always paired with the lyrically evocative titles that Johns gave to the paintings. In my own poem, I've tried to channel his crosshatch method in two ways. As you'll see, I've arranged the stanzas of my poem in a way that hopefully echoes the crosshatch pattern of his paintings. And content wise, my poem also has a kind of crosshatch effect. The poem is organized in four line vignettes. So as you're listening, you'll experience a leap or a shift every four lines. And I'm so glad that the poem will be projected as it is now so that it'll help you to follow along. Uh, thank you all very much for, for listening. This is Crosshatch. I stood before it, the rectangle of gray wax on a canvas, its expanse a kind of pastoral. The teeth marks in its center, the painting an apple. I stood there as though inside an idea materializing. Johns said, take an object, do something to it, do something else to it, paint it, then eat it. A painting like the back of the man wearing a black coat, a painting like a piece of paper repeatedly stepped on on a sidewalk, a painting like the purple foil balloon caught in the yellow ginkgo tree, a painting like a chorale, a painting like people moving with flashlights in a forest. The acrostic act is a catalyst for observation, association, and dream. It is like the flaneur's arc of walking, seeing, and reverie. I see you move down the busy block before you have seen me, and I look away to make another image in my mind, to have it take the force of the blow. If I were like that ivory hippopotamus on whom the Egyptian artist has etched the reeds where the actual hippopotamus would have stood hidden in its element, I would have on my body the names of every beloved, each sweet chemical burn like a drop of vanilla on the tongue. The piazza was imperceptibly concave, like an enormous shallow bowl. People sat there in clusters, as though having a picnic on grass instead of cobblestones. Centuries of earthquakes had struck the church, but on one wall, whose fresco was otherwise gone, a thigh pierced by an arrow. One of them takes his bed sheet and paints a flag on it. The other takes his pillow and quilt and fixes them to canvas. Sleep, dream, and work equal love. 
the grimy window like a calendar, paint on the floors like notes on staves. As Constable said, painting is another word for feeling. Like looking into someone's desk drawer when they are away or after they have died, stencils, newspapers, beeswax, enamel, tin cups, spoons, broom, ruler, flags, busted chair, mannequin leg, each defining what John's said of the poetic, something that conveys many meanings at once. To know something, you have to describe it or praise it or fear it or turn aside from it in a precise gathering of contradictions. In the painting of the three magi, one king kneeling in front of Mary and the baby Christ has first taken off his crown, which is now on the ground beside him. The ocean is so large, it doesn't have to know what it is, yet it desires to know its own boundaries the way a tree does, or a mouse, or a house. I am a mud man. I am made of mud. I think of mud the way a light bulb is preoccupied with light, the way water is preoccupied with the shore. Crosshatch of scent, crosshatch of light snow, crosshatch of cicadas, crosshatch of the mirror, and crosshatch of the corpse, crosshatch of the tantric detail, crosshatch of dancers on a plane, crosshatch of weeping women, crosshatch of the clock, and crosshatch of the bed. There will be time to get it right. And so over years, he works a thought repeatedly. This shows that identity is what you can't help but express over and over. Identity is repet repetition. The self is maps. The self is numbers. The self is a string between eternities. There will be time to get it right. Once I lived in a district of a city that was like being in a series of blue velvet rooms in a mansion. I read four books in a row that quoted Sontag. The books were as different as the seasons. It was winter, naked, like what Sontag said on page one, on page 33, death is the opposite of everything. A painting like a forest of kelp under the sea. A painting like the black heap of a collapsed piano. A painting like the traffic on the avenue moving in slow peristaltic life. A painting like blue roses, gray roses. A painting like white trees, the cops of hushed ideas in the mind. What stories lie in paintings? In Rembrandt's portrait of John Pellicorn and his son, the son is four years old. It is 1632 and the painting is about Pellicorn's riches and his wish for riches for his son. A bag of money passes between their hands. The son who would later trade in slaves. In my mind, in the map of my neighborhood, here is the teriyaki place, the drugstore, the church. Here is the market where the Samoan men shop on weekends wearing sarongs. Here is the house with the Confederate flag on a pole in the front yard. Here is the house with springs lilacs. First, Bradford lays down a map of LA, layers other papers and materials on it 
like a reverse archaeology. Then he begins the proper archaeology of stripping, cutting, tearing, exposing, so that the surface of the painting, he says, feels like lacerations, almost like scarring, like bullet wounds. Yao asks, what does it mean to be a thing caught in and carried along by time? The surface of each painting is a skin that suffers the question. The skin of rough traces, the skin of marks. One tall letter at a time, words appear on the surfaces like billboard signs annotating the world. Every image is a piece of information. When he spent a year painting clouds, Constable looked up at the weather and his own moving mind. Each day was an experience of something not sublime exactly, but entire. This is the sky and its clouds. I stand under them. This is its chronicle. In the still life that will finally contain everything, there will be a coffee can, a mirror, a seahorse, the Mona Lisa. There will be the trumpet, the jockstrap, and the roadkill we scavenged for a high school prank. My next life gaining in me, like water coursing fiercely up a tree's trunk. Thoreau said, the poet writes the history of his own body, the painter the same. I stand before his painting and understand the solitude that is the solitude of the body, as though solitude could be named, as though he had left his wallet, glasses, and keys in a shoe by the side of a river. Thank you all so much for listening. And I wanted to mention also that this, this poem is very much dedicated to uh, Jasper Johns. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our next reader, Khadija Queen. Thank you so much for that gorgeous uh, poem, Rick. Um, thank you to Linnea and to Greg and everyone who's been working so hard to put this together. Thank you, Brian, for the invitation. And as Rick named us, the cohort of poets. Uh, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate this chance to spend time with Jasper John's work and creative process with such talented poets. I'm a bit of a process nerd. And so in encountering John's work um, so deeply for, this, for the writing of this poem, I felt most struck by works where that process is left transparent. So the collages, the flags, the maps, the numbers, while researching the meanings behind these paintings and the artist's intentions and in keeping with the theme of mirroring, I did find some kinship in the fact that we are both veterans. And I saw in the flag works, especially a material willingness to question and engage surfaces and veneers, layers of meaning and illusion with regard to the emblematic yet ordinary and functional objects and symbols that we encounter every day. Also in John's art, there is often a simultaneous clear revelation alongside apparent inscrutability that my own work at times lies adjacent to. I'm also um, thinking of the present moment. I think I'm still writing this poem, um, but when I started, I could not let go of the present moment, like what we're experiencing globally, even as we viewers and perhaps makers of art um, go back and spend time with works made in the past as a kind of repetitive immediacy, the double weight of understanding. In that spirit, I've written a nine part poem in sequence, starting with zero. Collage unfinished, zero. Which primary flag flattens first? 
and the cooling process of building back out of referential tatters, theoretically, I choose to cover some things over. Flip side, glue, adhere to handmade paper, the train tracks, Mars, sunset, swamp shore, all the shapely hues of arrival, the lush sensation dreams to snip landscapes out, avoid the rising scandal of percentages as if life depends upon determined ignorance. Lines on screens snake up to where the sky cuts off. One, to tear is to make a mess, unpolished or profane. Who would let show such jagged edges Mod Podge marks, smudged charcoal. Why let the human in, inculcate flaw instead of money? Heads of state discuss in place of action. Each stagnancy a paper dagger I rip out of a magazine. Whose illusion of proof matters most? Whose repetition, contrition, invasion, suspicion sears itself into the pulp? Hands decide background black, melancholic, mixing palimpsest, shadow, mirroring the volume of denial. Who has permission to cross hatch a crude surface? Who gives it? Two, dear pseudo monochrome, I locate a mind practice in your quasi maps of language, washed gray, white and pasto escape attempt from questions as expression against my open will. Three cheers for every bruised constructor's problem. Objects in their transformations ordering the brushes rough irreverence. Green mud, white crusts, elementary yellow and blue gridded to utter what counts, fails, builds in failure. Three, regrets for as long as we've been losing our brothers. Plexiglass proves inadequate, false vision attached. The wet, wet fingerprint whipped out of shape and into slick arrays. Whose fantasy is this? Whose stuccoed textures mock winds facts? The white flag holds no surrender. Four, to resist death, I search each evening in a poem for the mesh overshot. The overlapping lines mapped by the dim lens of oblivion captured on gessoed surfaces that last, of course, much longer than flesh. Strings skip, catch language, catch metallic relief. Palette of clues, less titillation, more shattered monolith. Five, arrow stamped, the composition gives as if to charity faded patterns we casually recognize as targets and watch official forces of sight take aim. Six, resources join the first traditional impulse to fold, invert, beautifully neglect to invite the parallel, cut, screen push and numbers up stone matrix of understanding as understanding and lay it face down. This late, I can't resist uncategorizable directness as leftovers, the work of proofs. Not enough of us pay attention to those who really know how to live. Seven, reusing marks, arrangements occur. Seasons layer over our painstaking lives in caustic. What we consume scrapes its way in harsh visual impersonation of comfort. Even small grace, however, has vast potential. Let's eat the complex play of destruction. Eight, satisfaction doesn't exist unless we embrace the hidden beginnings. Starting over as praxis, completion as the way to disappoint the too earnest weaver who wept best kept every secret tucked in color beneath insistent decay. Never mind circumstance forced devotion, dear sequence, I shape to you. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Cole Swenson. Thank you, Khadija. That was gorgeous. And thank you, Rick. Uh, and 
thanks also to Linnea and to Brian Tier for getting us all together. Um, so I'm going to uh, read a piece that the really the only thing you need to know is that the piece we're starting out looking at, uh, Perilous Night, refers to an altarpiece, uh, the Eisenham altarpiece, which has to do with the life of St. Anthony. So it's called Driving the Dark. There are things that drive only at night and others that drive only the night and still others that drive the night only, a lonely St. Anthony and each with its own everything. And questioning, perilous night, 1982, the fact of a man struck down by a light just because it was holy. I was intrigued by a line on page 30 of the catalog that reads, quote, Night Driver, 1960, which was inspired by John's first memory of driving through the dark. Driving through, not in, and not the dark, not darkness, and the, not the night. And there's no elaboration or citation of this claim. We have no idea where whoever wrote it, the essay has multiple authors, got the fact, nor whether it's exact or paraphrased, invented, etc. Just a child, four or five, coming home with his parents quite late, in the back seat, isolated and looking out with his eyes riveted at the window because he's suddenly seen that the dark is not only huge, but moving. And it's not at all daunting. In fact, it gives him a comfort as large as its own expanse, encompassing the endless possibilities of blacks, charcoals, graphites, slates, all of them also in motion and which he knows he's somehow controlling and inhabiting along with so much uncanny and bright, so many galaxies later and constellations placed in the empty spaces of bookcases. Or a young man who just got his license, whose car could he have been driving, coming again home through the dark in a new time alone, shadows own. He cast his shadows down, they fall on the seasons, for instance, on summer, on winter, on all of them, on every shadow that falls on also falls beyond, falls through the surface, taking us along while another shadow remains there, a stain. And he looked up from his hands, still gripping the wheel, still moving, though no longer enormous. Instead, somewhere you could live, and did, but let's go back to the hands. He had a first memory and it was not that it was dark. No, it's that it was the dark and that it was driving. And there are hands there. Fast forward, 1965, Skin with O'Hara poem. Now the hands appear as if on the other side of a transparent pane, which makes it a window, which means there's a world back there working its way backward and we follow. Hands flat against glass and still driving. In fact, it's only always about his hands and about what they're holding, which is pretty much all art. Hands holding something, tool or material, and then beginning to move. O'Hara twirling a pencil around his fingers and then going off somewhere with it across paper. Quote, the clouds go soft and out of kilter. And earlier, 1963, hand, the hands first appeared alone, each a black sky on its own with a star in the palm and around each one, a halo of invention that renders the hands alive within. Hands without number and free in their orbit, creating the immense gravity of night driver, draining its weight in varying darks, line after line, a fine rain of vertical strokes with a predella of the same, which always tells a story. 
It's the story of a night in shreds cut by thin cracks of light. It's the story of a saint who fainted at the sight. Saint Dark, he remembered driving at night and never remembered anything else. Saint Night, a product of that dark, which is always larger and counts you down in spite of yourself. And in spite of yourself, you find that it's you who's driving and that it's you who's counting, who's casting numbers in bronze, in iron, in copper and silver, just to shiver and lightly shatter. There are numbers all over the night. They show up again and again in squares, in ages, in tongues. In O'Hara, standing against the sea, watching the sinking clouds and thinking, I remember driving through the dark and it warmed up the world. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Brian Tier with another thanks for asking us all to join you in this great project. Good evening, everyone. I am so grateful to everyone at the PMA. Um, and especially Linnea and Greg. And I am really grateful to all the poets um, whose work is so inspiring. I am, the poem, the chunk of a, the poem I'm about to read doesn't refer to any one particular John's painting. So those of you who love the images, um, this poem is more an homage um, to process like Khadija, I'm a process nerd. And so I was really interested um, in the paintings of John's that refer to the tradition of painting that have that beautiful um, formal life, but also uh, tend to exceed the frame in some uh, really powerful way. I'm wondering, can y'all see me? I can't see myself. Yes, I can see you. Okay, great. So I will, great. Um, so I will um, go ahead and read some sections. This is a, it turned out to be a much longer poem. So uh, this is section one of a poem called Association Copy, uh, which is dedicated to my friend, Stephen Motika. Nausea collage these works on paper, a way to begin, elegant, everything unfinished. I'm still thinking about painting. San Francisco winter returns, its thin light rinsed in acidic etching everything's edges. At the museum, we're looking at panels by Ellsworth Kelly. I'm bored by their bright, glossy geometry. And my friend Francis says something like, imagine choosing not to use most of the tools at your disposal. That's useful for me. A poem begins when I've forgotten how to make one. I don't know why. One day the tools are gone, as are the rules that guide their use. Then what? Another doctor's appointment first disgust, to give up, to get rid of the language value of anything at all, or to do the work, to doubt that the work needs doing. I open the notebook. I feel stupid choosing making in the waiting room. Pain scale, color field, patient history, pale tile of the clinic bathroom. Then what? I take a number. Why? Go on. Being ill in my 30s is like certain paintings in the 60s. Agnes Martin saying yes to the grid and no to pretty much everything else. Horizontal lines for 40 years, she says in documentary footage, must be some kind of record. Her certainty and discipline, her tape and ruler, those graphite lines floating on gesso. Abstraction seems double voiced. Saying yes to what, saying no to what is what I ask, negotiating. Defined object, define event. 
move the inside of the picture between invisible and visible, the ineffable and the clinic. What is considered to be the material, flower, fruit, phallus, book and vase? What principles obeyed? What principles refused, embodied by what materials and processes? The morning I vomit between parked cars and stand up, fog rolling off Twin Peaks, not a drawing, not a structure, not a speech, not a construction. With a stained collar, I go to the doctor. And now here is Jasper Johns, who writes in a sketchbook, it is what it does. What can you do with it? During the years preceding her psychotic break and his breakup with Rauschenberg, Martin lived on Quinty Slip and Johns on Pearl Street, a short distance neither crossed to the other. Her biographer, Nancy Prinsensall, argued that Johns was developing a language that had much in common with Martin's. Would either ultimately agree with that? In the early 60s, certain of their canvases might have had a passing resemblance, but Martin's metaphysical obsessions were in part informed by visionary experience. Johns had aesthetic obsessions in part informed by the gay male coterie of Rauschenberg, Cage, and Cunningham, and in part by art history, Duchamp in particular. Abstraction for her meant a fairly limited vocabulary, whereas for him it meant a rearrangement. Ability, not sadness, just disaster. What's the event that bisects a biography after which nothing is the same? What's the shape of the moment when you lose everything except your life? Double negative, skull against canvas. Outside the doctor's office, my love and I part ways. I take a different route home, avoiding Dolores Park, its empty wintry hill, to ask another artist afterward, how do I do this? Writing or painting as a way of writing or painting or as a way of doing something else, another possibility. Way can be used to mean, this is the way I do this. This is the way he does this. This is the way he does it. I do it this way. The event's so big, my body can't hold it. I need to build a structure it can live in. Lead suction, bronze junk, glove, glass, brush, dark glass to mouth. It swallows everything. I follow the taste of salt, thinking until the ambulance arrives. What's that even mean? I hear myself saying to the EMT. Someone pulls a curtain across it this wordless event that never ends. Find one way to describe the event and the objects. I choose making with a lack of time, money, health, and health insurance, lacks that seem immovable and mark making indelibly. Is this best shown by painting? Sorry, is this shown by pointing to it or by hiding it? I think of the early Johns for whom a painting is both event and object. What kind of event? The nature of the object produced during such a period, he replies. Sick in bed, I cut up source texts in my own lyrics and hang fragments in juxtaposition on the grid of the page. The elements should neither fit nor not fit together. A clear object, an unclear object. What kind of object? It is what it does. Collage puts pressure against live constraints. My assemblages do not resemble precarious employment, low income illness or medical debt, and they propose new ways to experience them. The application of the eye, the business of the eye, almost tautological. The event provides the occasion for the object whose nature is produced by the event, not freedom but more room to move. How did I get here? What I too often edit out, I'm sick among people. 
not unlike John's in documentary footage, intent on the etching plate in the midst of a busy studio. I am at work, paying this tricky spot, his little brush dabbing at it. A tendency here to involve the eye and the arm. My friend Miranda says, you're in a healing crisis. And then the doctor's awkward small talk before the rectal exam, the receptionist saying, we'll bill you. Even then, even in debt, the genuine, the miraculous, vocative, being called into being in certain areas, one figure becomes the ground for the other figure. How I say I'm broke and Antia asks, you're broken? Paint can't do that. The rough voice of the nurse saying hello when I wake up in the ER. Aim for maximum difficulty, writes Johns, in determining what has happened. If biography doesn't take care of that, hospital wait. It's all so interesting. I forget to cry. The way an abstract canvas relates to its title, what language does. X-rays and blood work, a grid called tree, surprise medical billing. Choosing making, I choose how to continue to live, believing painting to be a language. There seems to be a pressure area underneath after the emergency. I find comfort in the wisdom figure Agnes made of herself, a role John's assiduously avoids. I'm consoled by grids that for her represent innocence, her writings, dogmatic certainties, and even her famous provocation that the wiggle of an earthworm is more important than the assassination of a president. In this respect, she and John sometimes resemble each other in a context, within a context, writes John's, to what degree movable. I arrive at every moment undiagnosed, language which operates in such a way as to force the language to change toward new recognitions, the wordless event of which any visual form is evidence. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all. I really, it's wonderful to hear you read in sequence. You can hear the correspondences and the resonances sort of between your different investigations of John's. Uh, I see so many lovely comments coming in um, that also seem to have very much enjoyed it. We do have a little bit of time, and, and I would um, love to hear from all of you about the process of writing this poem. You know, the invitation you got many months ago now was to write a poem that responds to Jasper Johns. It's a pretty open invitation. Um, so I'm gonna ask you each to share a little bit about what the process of writing the poem was like. And Brian, I'm hoping you will kick us off as you also sort of masterminded and brought this group together. Well, that's generous. Um, I, my process obviously, is, as y'all could hear, had a lot to do with Agnes Martin um, because I wrote another book um, or I wrote a book before this um, in dialogue with Martin. So who, as, as y'all heard, like lived not that far from John's in, in a certain period of time. And they were working in New York at, at the time that um, John's kind of became famous. And um, so my way into John's was through her and, um, and through John's, is, what's true for me for both of them is through their language. Um, he has these wonderful sketchbooks, um, like she has a lot of writings. And so his sketchbooks, I found really interesting and I, I, pretty much all the language that people quoted in the chat, that none of that was mine, that was all um, John, from John's sketchbook or from scholars or something. So most of, much of what was an autobiography of my own was link, borrowed language. And I just find that period of collage um, in his work uh, just so powerful. Um, so, so totally powerful. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, I, I, I could talk more, but I'm really interested in hearing what other people have to say. That's where I started and sort of the, the poems just kind of blown up into a much longer project, so. Wonderful, thank you. 
Khadija, you know, Brian mentioned collage, and I know you were thinking about collage, so maybe you could share a little bit about what the process was like for you. Sure, yeah. Um, I sort of make collages myself, but I just, I just make them for me. Um, and sometimes friends who know that I do it and will ask me for them. I was making one for um, the Emily Dickinson house of her dress and mixing paper collages and digital collage. And um, so I, I would make collages and watch YouTube videos about Jasper John and sort of process those two things together and then get some time to just write the poem. I think maybe two thirds of it was done all at once. And then I added some more in the next couple of days and then I would go back and revise it. And they're kind of out of the, or the original order. So I would read it over and over again. And then um, I think the first number zero was like number four or something. So just trying to um, arrange it to build intensity, but also to like open it up with something that wasn't introductory because it doesn't seem to me that John's work is introductory at all. It just gets you right with what it is and you have to articulate it. So that was my process. Thank you. Rick, what was it like for you? Um, it was a lot like the way I do other poems that I've written in that I, I had an idea, in this case, I had an assignment, and then I had thankfully months to think about the assignment. And so I did a lot of reading, a lot of looking, and also just observing myself, um, observing what came up in my mind, uh, what associations came up, and what I could do with all of those associations. Because um, when I was reading the, the, all of the materials that I could about John, John's, he wasn't necessarily forthcoming about what his own project was, which is very different from, uh, let's say, Agnes Martin, who is very explicit about all of her motivations, all of her ideas. And so John's was a little bit of a cipher in that way. And so he was no help in that way. But it became an opportunity in the sense that, oh, I feel like I have permission to, in a way, project all kinds of ideas and interpretations and feelings. Um, when I encountered his work. And that's why the poem that I came up with is kind of this just sort of mishmash of associations, you know, ranging from John's himself all the way to um, Mark Bradford's work, who I've been really invested in uh, recently, and trying to sort of, in my own mind, connect the dots among all of these different things that I was engaging with during the span of time that I was working on the poem. Um, so that, that was my, what my process was like. Thank you. And Cole, how about for you? Um, I, I like what you just said, Rick, about, and John's wasn't much help on that because I've, I've um, been really interested in the past few years of writing, using writing to look at particularly paintings, but art in general, more deeply. I just find writing in front of a piece just gets me into it in a much more invested way. So I, I do that a lot, but I also then love just reading about the person's life and particularly autobiographical anecdotes sometimes just reveal so much that really adds another insight. But as Rick said, John's famously doesn't talk about himself. And so trying to get that personal level and try and weave that into it, um, I, I thought was a, a really fun challenge. Um, so I ended up also, I felt, uh, really getting a lot out of the catalog essays, uh, which I, I really loved. And I was intrigued by, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten whose line it was, but the line was the notion of that all that darkness in John's work, he handled, he managed. Uh, he, and so I interpreted that as he drove it. And so that concept that the dr night driver and the early memory just brought that all together uh, for me in a way that just launched the piece. 
Thank you. It was um, such a pleasure for me um, when we came together for the rehearsal and then tonight to hear all these poems come together. Cole, you know, listening to you talk about um, writing about visual art, um, it, it makes me want to pose the same question to the others here. Um, how do you think about writing about visual art, a painting? Big question, take it as you will. Um, I will say that I have been doing it for as long as I've been writing poetry because I also make art. So it's not really separate from what my practice is. So I think all of my books have some kind of ekphrastic piece in it. I think my first book was um, Deka and the latest one um, was um, Georgia O'Keeffe. So I just, it's part of how I make things. It feels like, as Brian was saying, another language. So if we can access another language within the poetry, I think that it becomes addictive. I was really interested. I came to Agnes, that is the first book I wrote where after I had become um, a typesetter and letterpress printer, like fully. So one of the things that I kind of got out of Agnes when I returned to the to writing was the fact that the typeset page is also a grid um, and a matrix. And so I, one of the things that I love about what I would call like kind of critical ekphrasis, like sort of engaging not just in the surface of the work, but the, the process of making um, is the way in which the poem itself or the, the page can be a kind of visual space and a non-semantic space, a space that communicates a lot, can be really emotional, can be really embodied, but doesn't necessarily use semantic language. Um, or semantic meaning or grammar. And I really love that about the visual life of the potential visual life of poems. And I, I also feel it's kind of like an underutilized part of um, poetry sometimes. And so I think that was one thing I really connected with again with, with the Johns um, that connected me back to Agnes was um, the ways in which he challenges the sort of frame of the painting and also the surface of the painting um, and how exciting that would be to sort of like create a frame on the page that you then violate or um, exceed in some way. So I really, yeah, I felt suddenly that there was, got a lot of formal inspiration from thinking about that. But also like Cole, I, I, well, unlike Cole, I hadn't written, I wrote most of this without actually seeing the paintings in person. And then I recently was able to see the New York exhibit and that changed a lot for me. And hopefully I will get to Philly before um, you close. But I did, it was the first time I'd really seen the work in person and really saw the break, the work from the breakup uh, period. And it just really did a lot. And I, in a way that, um, I remember the first time I actually saw the Agnes's after reading about her. And so I do think there is something that you're saying, Cole, of like this, the presence, the aura of the work, writing in relationship to it is, is also something I value, though don't get to do often enough. That was a wonderful question, Linnea, uh, about uh, our engagement with the ekphrastic. And I think like the other poets in this cohort, I've been writing uh, ekphrastic poems since the very start of my writing life as a poet. But I think a really crucial change for me as a person who has been doing that is initially I thought of uh, writing ekphrastic poems as a way of kind of celebrating the aesthetic experience of other works of art. But that sh that the shift that I've experienced is has been in trying to locate the the social, the political, the ethical in works of art, and that to me was sort of the the conundrum that I faced thinking about um, Jasper Johns's work, 
um, if he is fairly reticent about any agendas that he might have in that work, how can I locate that in his work for myself? And it's all over his work, of course. Um, you know, just the fact that he's most famous for that flag painting, first of all, which is so encoded with different kinds of significances that are social and political and historical. And, you know, the queerness in his work as well. So that kind of, um, you know, engagement that I, I, I had to kind of like find for myself in his work regarding those things that are pretty important to me now, that was kind of the engine of the ekphrastic for me. I was engaging with the work ekphrastically, but also in these other ways that are not usually thought of as being part of the ekphrastic transaction. Thank you. I, wow. I wish we could uh, keep going forever, but we will not. Uh, we will, in fact, wrap up. And so thank you um, for these really beautiful poems, um, for this lovely conversation. It was a joy to see this all come together and to share this space with you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Linnea. Thank you, thank you everybody. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Linnea, Thanks. Greg, and Steve for making this happen. Um, well, we are we are so appreciative. Um, we're also grateful to the sponsors of the exhibition and our colleagues at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art, who worked so hard to realize this unprecedented collaboration. Of course, um, to all of you who joined us this evening, thank you. We're, we're so grateful to have you here uh, to share this space with you and to share this poetry with you. If you haven't had enough Jasper Johns, there is a conversation on printmaking and Johns next Thursday. Uh, we'll put the link in the chat. And of course there is a follow-up email. It'll include all the links we shared tonight. It'll include a recording of this program so you can look back at anything you like. Um, a final note that when this uh, webinar closes out, a survey will pop up in your browser. We really do take all your feedback to heart and it helps us make better programs. So thank you for sharing any feedback you have. And with that, I, I wish you all a very good night. <laughs>